Rasco's Modern Life and Steve Baxi of Steve Baxi's YouTube channel. Hi. Hello. Yeah, yeah, we're having a good time here talking about about sharing porn on social media. Um, Future topic coming soon. But if you want to share Geeky Gentlemen on social media because we're your porn, that's totally understandable. And keep in mind, you can now download episodes of Geeky Gentlemen, the audio from episodes of Geeky Gentlemen, and listen on the go so you can jerk off while you're driving to our sensual voices. Um, in any case, this week I, I forgot to announce a topic last week, and so I had to kind of come up with something um, throughout the week, and I, I think I've got something pretty good that, that I stumbled upon. Just doing a Twitter rant, because I've started doing those, if you want to follow me on Twitter. Uh, so this week we're discussing environmentalism and superheroes. And we might, might expand that to other geopolitical social issues, depending on how much we have to say about environmentalism on its own. So we'll, we'll see if we get there. It'll be not. tough, because I feel like environmentalism, especially lately, has been relating into so many other issues, like environmental racism and stuff. Yeah, it's, it's a really big issue, so I don't know if we're ever going to get done with environmentalism or if it's going to just naturally branch out to those. So we'll see what happens here. We're going to go deep. Uh, really deep. Yep. Deep and hard. <laughs> oh, this is what happens when we start off talking about porn. Anyway. Oh, man, I just wanted to... <laughs> Suddenly you want to change your mind. You want to make this topic about porn. <laughs> uh, specifically about the weirdness of sharing porn. <laughs> um, but anyway, no, like, uh, I guess we'll... I, I think a good place to start would be what started me on this line of thought, which is, what the fuck hasn't Poison Ivy been used as a villain lately? What's up with that? Um... I don't... I don't know. <laughs> I, I like that's that's really what got me on this line of thinking is is Poison Ivy is one of the like if you think eco terrorist for comic books there's that's your number one choice right so like her and then Razal Ghul interestingly enough both Batman villains but you, you think eco terrorism you think Poison Ivy so just like why in a world where we're getting more and more seeing the the actual cost of global warming. Are we not using a character who's created almost entirely to be an eco terrorist? What? Why are we not using her as a supervillain more? Why are are superheroes not addressing this issue? The whole point of superheroes, to one degree or another, is to like take a stand outside the law and tell us how we should be doing things yeah. or, or the approach we should have to stuff. So why are why aren't superheroes dealing with global warming? Okay, to be fair, though, um, I think this is a problem that's both consolidated, like most things in comics, more towards the big two than it is anyone else. Um, mm -hmm. Because if you go to Image or you go to IDW or Dark Horse, they've got comics that, that particularly deal with these issues, like um, Warren Ellis' Trees, for example. And then if you go and read Simon Furman's Transformers run, that entire uh, entire book is a commentary on global warming. Interesting. Okay. Um, again, it, it's weird, because when we say superheroes, we mean Marvel and DC, right? 
Like, there's, that's not the way it should be. I don't mean to step on the smaller companies, but when I think superheroes, I can go through about 20 to 30 characters before I get out of Marvel and DC. That's fair. Um, um, and so, yeah, you're right about that, Steve. Other companies do address it. Um, I just don't understand why we haven't addressed it more. So I guess just seriously... Why the fuck are we using su- Poison Ivy as a supervillain? It's potentially... So, like, I guess it's just... It could be just because global warming is in itself, or climate change, is such an inherently nuanced and, like, really complicated debate. And... um, So, like, I, I one of the biggest things is, like do maybe it's a matter of like they don't know how to if we're talking if we talk about superheroes as like the people that are supposed supposed to set like a moral example or something like that Mm -hmm. often like what's the answer to climate change like current as it's happening right now and just fucking quit polluting the earth (laughs) (laughs) yeah but like and then if you like it may, but it's it's obviously a lot more complicated than that, right? So, like, obviously, mm-hmm. climate ch- climate change is an incredibly horrible and dangerous thing, and it's one of the most like immediately dangerous things to humanity and its existence on Earth. But then, at the same time, like, th- depending on like what you do, there are a lot of countries that like have yet to pull themselves out of the economic sl- like out of like the economic low rings. They've they've they haven't like been able to do that but they are the countries that like if they were that that market that they would break into would be in like the natural natural energy market and stuff like that so it's like if you go away from like fossil fuel energy you wind up having like a lot of countries that will probably never be able to economically pro won't have the economic prosperity that other countries that have like more focused more on providing. Yeah. Yeah. There's this like India and China have made those arguments against America about, um, you know, going clean quote unquote clean energy is, well, you got to your current economic status by not caring about clean energy and we're just trying to get to there. So why do you get to lecture us on what you already did? And that's that's it's a very good argument. It's also a very stupid argument. It's, it's just like you fucked up, so why can't we fuck up? It's very dangerous <laughs> thinking. It's also very common thinking when it comes to most energy economics, which is irritating. Um, and you yeah. know, it it becomes kind of like this question of like, yeah, but if saving the planet means that we have to like short in, like we have to give you like the shaft when it comes to you know cashing in on natural energy like fossil fuels like if it means saving the planet then yeah i'm kind of against shafting you if that means you're if you're gonna destroy the earth by enriching your country economically i kind of don't give a shit about you like i'm sorry and you would think like to rope this background a little bit you'd think something like i don't know you could do a really interesting nuanced story where like superman starts to notice that his powers over the years have gotten a little bit weaker because of the extra co2 in the air that's making it difficult for the sun's rays to hit him as directly as they used to. or maybe because the ozone layer is opened up he gets even more powerful oh there's that too or you could also do something um you could also do more stuff with a with, like, Ra's al Ghul and the League of Shadows and, like, how their hideouts have, like, gone away because of the remote areas they used to be in that are now affected by pollution. Can I talk about what I want to do with Green Lantern and environmentalism? Go for it. Okay, so, like, one of the, like, major tenets in the Book of Oa of what a Green Lantern is supposed to do, I think it's, like, rule two or three, is protect all life in their sector. So why the fuck isn't Green Lantern, like, shutting down logging operations that are threatening creatures' environments? Like, that should be a thing that the, that a Green Lantern does, right? Is protecting, in, in doing environmental protection so that one species on a planet doesn't completely wipe another out. That that just would make sense. Okay. You're so, making Green like, Lantern I, I, look I, I, bad, dude. You, you need to stop insulting him. He's a hard worker. I love Green Lantern, but, like, that's a story that needs to be told with Green Lantern. It's so weird, like, Aquaman's usually the only one consistently fighting for the environment, and people rag on him for it. (laughs) And, like, other characters should be doing this shit, too. 
like Wonder Woman a little bit too, but she's usually more geopolitics centered on violence than than uh, environmentalism. Yeah, I always thought it would be cool. This is kind of off topic, but it's on the subject of Poison Ivy. I always thought um, it would be cool if like the the third Dark Knight trilogy film was a movie about Poison Ivy, and she's just an eco terrorist. Um, it would have fit. And then you could still have like the weird like Bruce Wayne clean energy project thing, and you could even work in Talia Al Ghul also. But mm-hmm. you just have Poison it, it Ivy instead of Bane, and like she would have her own inherent uh, like motivations aside from the League of Shadows, um, because it, her she would be like environmentally motivated, so where the League like... of Shadows would be slightly different. Instead of getting, like, a, a better remake of Batman Robin, then you'd get, like, a better remake of Batman Forever. <laughs> yeah, exactly. Yeah. Um, and, and it'd be interesting to do with, like, Nolan's kind of... It seems like it's toward the right, but not quite. Uh, like, his, his whole politics with Batman is, like, it seems right, right-wing, but not quite the more you think about it. Um, and, and so, yeah, that, that would have really fit. And it, just more generally... Ra's al Ghul is an eco-terrorist. Poison Ivy is an eco- eco-terrorist. Why don't they ever team up? Why hasn't Ra's al Ghul had a baby with Poison Ivy? <laughs> <That'd> be shit. <laughs> like, no, I mean, just seriously, why haven't they done something together? No, I agree with you. Because I mean, she said no. <laughs> well, her and then also Lady Shiva, because Lady Shiva's done a lot of things, particularly in the 90s, that have to do with early global warming stuff and early climate change stuff. Like... There, she had a whole thing with Tim Drake Robin for a while where they were talking about how um, industrialization around Europe has killed a lot of uh, forests and landmarks and killed all certain animal species and such. And so she makes it her job to do corporate espionage in order to, like, stop the industrialization as, as much as she can by herself. Mm-hmm. Um, and we, we've completely forgotten that. We've completely forgotten Lady Shiva, period. But we forgot that plot point also. Yeah, she's one of those characters that just kind of faded away. Um, yeah, it's it's interesting because like I, the reason I I want them to use Poison Ivy specifically more just because Razzle Ghoul's kind of become a little bit watered down from the eco side of things, yeah. and now he's just more generally people are bad. Ever since Batman um, Begins, he's kind of like slowed away from that. Yeah, and it's it's whatever. He'll get back to it eventually, I'm sure. They, these things tend to be cyclical. As we become uh, closer to the apocalypse from the environment, we'll bring yeah, it back. Yeah, pretty much. Um, no, just like Poison Ivy more specifically, because it's just, she has plant powers. It's kind of impossible not to have her be an eco-terrorist at a certain point. Um, you know, it's just, she's a character who is doing everything she can, no matter how morally unsound, to protect the environment. And Batman is a character who naturally not only has the means to help protect the environment, but has the the motivation to help do it, and is at the same time trying to be a moral person. So again, why aren't we doing more stuff with that? Why isn't he question what where's the like epic Batman arc where he's questioning how he can stop Poison Ivy when he agrees with her goals. You know, in, in Batman and Robin, there's that scene between Poison Ivy and, and Bruce Wayne where she's like, here's all these proposals, you need to shut down like all these operations all at once. And he just like shrugs it off as, well, these are good proposals, but you would like put people out of their homes. And like that was the whole like motivation that she had to be completely evil from that point. I'm like, See, there's something to that, though, where Bruce just, like, cares more about people than he does about the world, but he kind of knows that they're obviously intertwined. So, I don't know, there's there's something to that, and I don't know why no one's done it. It seems like, for the most part, do you think, maybe this is a weird point, but may, do you think any of this, ha- any of this, like, the shying away from defending the environment in comics has anything to do with those really bad, like, Captain Planet car- cartoons and G.I. Joe PSAs at the end that would preach environmentalism in the dumbest way? Do you think it's all, like, a reaction to we don't want to be like that? I think it is just generally a, a sense of not wanting to be too preachy. Because yeah. there are, like, certain things where it's just like, okay, this is what it means when a cartoon's just trying to shoehorn in a lesson. Yeah. 
Um, you know, it's like that. It's like drinking and and drug use after school. It's basically like the whole Reagan thing. Um, it really is, though. It's like all of the things that Reagan was like at least superficially against. Um, <laughs> Steve, you're still watching Archer, aren't you? Yeah. Yeah. Did you get to Vice yet? I think so. Yeah. Yeah, the Archer Vice. You'd know if you got there. They changed the intro and everything. Yeah, yeah, yeah. It's the most. It's the most realistic espionage show in the world. But anyway, um, you know, it's just like Reagan had these these things that he was at least publicly against, even though he would, you know, sell drugs to the blacks. Um, <laughs> <laughs> once again, weird thing. But like, they, there was the you know the drug use, the alcohol use, uh, environments. Um, what else? Recycle. That's environment too. There'd be like those the shoehorned in little quick last minute things to make it seem like this cartoon of soldiers just shooting up a building had a message. Um, I'd be down for a reboot of Captain Planet that took itself just dead serious. That'd be really I, weird. Yeah, I mean, it'd be interesting. Ultimately, um, I'd want Captain Metaphysics first, but... Yes, <laughs> Captain Metaphysics! <laughs> Forbes! Numina! Monads! <laughs> I said it's solved. <laughs> um, oh, Central Comics is the best. I know, um, but no, no. I think that would be really interesting. And then Hellboy for a while in the comics was dealing with more environmentalism and stuff. And I feel like it's really easy to just like take any one of these comic book concepts and turn like an entire series into something that's about environmentalism. A lot of Peter David's Aquaman for a while started revolving around that, particularly when um, when. Aquaman became, when Orm became uh, close to King of Atlantis again, and Aqualad was now a Tempest, and he had all these magical powers and stuff, and it became a little bit about, like, how the ocean landscape had changed and fractured so much because of the problems of the surface world, um, and particularly the environmental impact of the surface world, and I wish we could go back and, like, expound on that more with Aquaman stuff, instead of just going, instead of doing the generic Aquaman wants relationships with the surface world thing. Yeah, and and again, like I feel like the um, the DCAU did a fairly good job of blending those two, right? Yeah, I wish he was in that show more. He has like all of three episodes. Yeah, but man, what 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 a great three episodes! No, I agree with you. I love their Aquaman. I just wish there was more of them. Yeah, um, I I think he's the only DCAU character that they completely rebooted. Um, well, they, yeah, because. He's in an episode of Superman the Animated Series. Yeah. And it's just like the orange shirt Aquaman, and then he comes back as the Peter David Aquaman, more or less. Um, but yeah, that that does raise a really good point. Of like, why is Aquaman the only one dealing with these issues? Is, is I wonder if it's just a thing of, of people think, oh, well, that's a boring issue, because maybe you're on to something, Rasko. There's no easy answer to it, so it's kind of hard to just write an ending to it. And so it's a, like it's a boring issue because you can't just have it be a bad guy behind it all. It's it's everybody that's done this. Yeah. I, I guess with other issues like corporatism or corrupt politicians and stuff, you can always turn the issue itself into a personified bad guy. If you do the story where Batman is fighting Poison Ivy and it's about global warming, how does the fight end? Like, it's it's one of those things where Batman always wins, but he's also always loses, right? Yeah. It's, it's that weird contradiction of, like, Batman always wins the day, saves the day, all that stuff. But it, there's often, like, a, a moral loss to it. He's he's often, like, compromised in some way, shape, or form. Um through winning, uh, and and that's that's what you do with that. Is yes, he defeats Poison Ivy, um, but it doesn't solve the issue of global warming. Like if he had just let her go through her plan, yeah, thousands would die, millions would die, but the Earth would be saved. So it's like Bruce Wayne now. So the way you solve that, I guess, is you have Wayne step in and do more to help the environment. But I I think part of the argument someone from Editorial would make then is it would have to be a status quo thing that you would have to deal with on a character level for, for many, many issues, if not a few years. So 
Like you would you wouldn't be able to get away with it just being a one-off story. Oh, certainly not. I'd want it to be more of an arc based thing, but just generally. Yeah, I mean, I think ultimately what you'd want to do is you'd want to go through like you you want to go back to almost a seventies format of like Poison Ivy shows up and goes away really quickly early on, and then you do a bunch of one and dones. But the common thematic thread would be that global warming idea, much like in the seventies when Man Bat showed up, and like he was a constant question to who Bruce Wayne was, despite very rarely appearing in those issues. Yeah, um, I haven't read that arc, but that sounds kind of like what I'm going for. Just this idea of, of Wayne um, trying to use all his resources to do all the best things. Because it's weird, Batman starts out as this idea of, I want to get rid of crime in Gotham City. And that's already, like, you know, just a hopeless goal. He's, he's never going to succeed at it. He's going to die trying. There's no other way for that story to end. But then as he encounters bigger and bigger threats in the world get, and gets further and further outside of himself and outside of Gotham City, he has to deal with bigger and bigger issues. And saving the Earth from itself is kind of, in a weird way, the ultimate Batman issue. <laughs> <laughs> Almost more so than Superman. Because Superman's like saving, more about saving humanity from itself. I think, <laughs> like, saving... The Earth from itself is, is more of a, like, somehow smaller Batman issue. Um, I don't know, maybe that's just me. Uh, no, I see what you're saying. Um, I think some of the interesting environmental questions you could even ask, though, I feel like it might even be difficult to... It's a thing where, like, superheroes get too real. Where, like, Reed Richards has got those unstable molecule uniforms, why isn't he giving it to firefighters? And, like, you wouldn't, <laughs> mm -hmm. if you did too much with the global warming thing, then the landscape of the comic book world would change too much from reality. Yeah, it's it's that thing of like one how how real can you keep your world when you introduce superheroes into it? Because like immediately it changes. You know, yeah. Superman shows up. Like if you did the the Man of Steel thing where you have a reasonably realistic world, Superman shows up. That world's changed the day they see that dude fly. Like, there's, there's no coming back from that. That is a brand new world. We now know that certain kinds of flight are possible. We now know that life exists out in the universe. There's, like, a million questions in science that are, like, factually answered. Um, Watchmen dealt with that with Dr. Forever. Manhattan. What? I said you've changed things forever. <laughs> yeah, yeah. No, I mean, Watchmen dealt with that with Dr. Manhattan. The idea, like, oh, well, he can teleport. Well, that proves teleportation is possible. Now we just got to figure out how to do it. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, like, it's, it'd be a difficult thing to rationalize in those kinds of universes. Now, another thing another thing with it, though, is, like, you could always do it in a more one and done format. You could make it You could make it part of a movie series. You could make it part of a TV show. And you could give it a beginning, middle, end. It doesn't necessarily have to be within the comics. Or... I think maybe this might be even a better idea. Instead of making it some kind of, like, Batman-centric or superhero-centric relationship, just keep Poison Ivy her own book and make make it about that. Just make it make it her going around the world trying to rectify the damages of global warming. Now, the question is, is she a hero, villain, or anti-hero? I mean, that that's what the book would deal with. You could write her in certain cases where she's being heroic. You could write her in certain cases where she's being villainous, but it all has to do with her protecting the Earth. And that's an interesting question, because, like, she's taken on this weird role that I don't like, and she's, like, maybe just shy of Harley Quinn now, where she's she's not a villain anymore. She's kind of just this, like, slightly anti-hero-ish character, and I don't like that approach. I like the idea that she is someone who cares too much about an issue that it is very easy to care too much about. To be fair, um, though, I feel like to make Harley Quinn into that weird not a villain anymore thing is more problematic than than Poison Ivy. I think Poison Ivy actually can be translated into a more redeemable character. Doing that to Harley Quinn destroys her purpose. Yeah, I agree to a certain extent. Um, I I I don't want to get into that whole thing right now, just because that's that's a little too separate for me. Sure, yeah. Um, but but I agree to a certain extent. Um. No, just, I, I don't like the idea of Poison Ivy, because I, I like the idea that she is introduced as a, a moral problem for Batman. How do I deal with someone who does the wrong things for the best possible reasons? 
how do I deal with someone that is willing to murder people on a global scale in order to save the planet? Punch her in the fucking face. <laughs> right? <laughs> Just kick her in the vagina a couple times. <laughs> um, <laughs> um, and I mean, that's partly why I think just giving her an ongoing might be interesting, because of all these weird, annoying tendencies to make villains heroes again, the two cases where I think it works the best are Poison Ivy and Magneto, because Colin Bunn's Magneto ongoing, when that was happening, was a really good example of him being both a horrible human being and a great one at the same time, and I think you could do that with Poison Ivy, and I think if you even kept the scale a bit smaller... You could deal with issues that aren't readily available to characters like Batman or Superman. Like, you can't, you can't in a comic, in the way that happened in Superman 4, have Superman just go around and, like, steal everyone's nukes. That just wouldn't work in a, with a Superman comic. But you can make it so that Poison Ivy goes around and starts destroying, like, nuclear testing sites around, around like, damaged forests and stuff. Like... The moral line that they're able to cross from a, from a more villainous perspective makes the critique of the issue more whole, because we have this thing in superhero comics where, like, if you decide if you design the arbitrary moral line of superheroes don't do this, this, and this, and a lot of times you fail to talk about the issues through every avenue, and like you you keep putting superheroes in impossible situations, and you keep contriving ways for them to get out of it, but if you just give it to the villain, then the villain can give you more nuance to that so your heroes aren't corrupted, but the issue is still addressed. Good point. Um, yeah, I I could see her doing that. I could see her getting her own series where she's doing stuff like that. That'd be really interesting. And it'd just be... Like, you, you could at no point have her very clearly be evil or very clearly be good, right? Like, she should... I, I think basically every issue should end with her killing someone but saving, you know, a forest. <laughs> I guess the it, it's the weirdest way to put that, but like I you know, every issue like the first issue would in my mind of that series then would end with her um like murdering a bunch of loggers in order to stop the destruction of an endangered forest. Yeah. And that would be that would be the perfect tone for that is well, we don't have an answer for whether or not this was the right thing to do. We spent, like, a bunch of pages showing you life in this forest and how precious it is, and then a bunch of pages showing you how these guys are just trying to make a buck, and this is the only way that they've found to do it, and then showing you her making the decision that one is more important than the other. Where do you stand on it? Yeah, I mean and that would be more fascinating than anything. I, I very, I wouldn't, I'd be worried about giving Poison Ivy her own book in that she would very, in that it would make her into a hero. Agent and that's Ivy. What I don't. That'd be her name. <laughs> Agent Ivy. Yeah. Takes yeah. on a fracking facility. Yeah. Right. I like. I. I just that'd be my worry though is that she'd become the hero of the book and that's not what I want with that character. Medical I think Ivy. you would. Because, I mean, a lot of people talk about this weird tendency for comics, particularly these days, to swing way more left than they do right. I, I, don't, I have my own opinions on that. I feel like comics have always been more leftist than right. But at the same time, I think it'd be interesting, which because global warming at, is seen wrongly, but is seen as more of like a leftist issue than a rightist issue. So mm-hmm. in a context where people think comics are going too far left, to make the personification of environmental damage into a villain and do those arguments might be a, a good way to, like, meet in the middle. Yeah. Then you, wouldn't be doing, you wouldn't be doing the same kind of, like, strong female character archetypes that Marvel's been doing, and at the same time you wouldn't be pandering to a particular audience. You'd make the issue more gray like it is in the real world. Which, again, I wouldn't, I wouldn't want that necessarily, but I feel like from... If you were DC Comics and you wanted to sell a book, that might be a good way to pitch it. Yeah, and just, I don't know, like, there's there's this idea that the the right wing, which has, you know, tried to deny global warming at every stand, at every point, um, th- they have this thing of, oh, well, we need to focus on job creation, we need to focus on people, and the whole argument from, you know, the, the logical side, which just happens to be the left in this case, is we don't have time for that this is happening 
now. You look at, like, seriously, California's in the worst drought it's ever had. Uh, you know, the fucking Louisiana is drowning right now. This is happening now. This is affecting people now. I get that people need to work and want to be prosperous and everything, but we don't have time to get to a point where everyone gets to be comfortable and then solve the issue. This is happening now. In order to have anything happen, we have to act now. Um, and and so that's that's why I think it's become like a right right left issue is the right just hasn't wanted to admit it's happening, and the left is the only side that does anymore. And that's that's a broad generalization, to be fair. Yeah, I mean, the real world political dynamic of of climate change is really confusing as is, but like. It comes back to the, the issue uh, that we raised when this topic first began of, like, because it's complicated, why are people at least attempting to talk about it in a more mainstream fashion in comics? Um, Nick Spencer's Captain America, I feel like at some point, it's weird that it hasn't come up anywhere. Like, he's so he's so political and satirical, it's odd that no one's even made, like, an offhanded joke about it. Um, I'm pretty sure there's been... Yeah, there's there's been one in the um, Sam Wilson book. Has there? Okay. Yeah, it was uh, the the head of the Serpent Society made a remark about air conditioners. Okay, uh, well, that's something. It's just it's weird that like there were very clearly characters designed to do this, like Swamp Thing. Where's Swamp Thing on this? Swamp Thing, like I love Jeff Johns to death, but. He did a weird direction with Swamp Thing. I don't even know what he was trying to do. And what the fuck was Scott Snyder doing with that? Book? I have no idea. Swamp Thing has not had the best, what, 15 years? <laughs> um, I can't remember the last yeah. time Swamp Thing had a consistently good book. Yeah, fuck you, Swamp <laughs> Thing. <laughs> I'm sorry, Rasko. We're kind of we've kind of taken off on you here. You you want to throw in? Um, no. No? Okay. <laughs> no, I just realized, oh shit, yeah, Rasko's here, and he hasn't talked in a while. Rasko, you want to talk? <laughs> I'm just I'm just in pondering ideas. <laughs> um, I do want to, if it's alright with you guys, I do want a minute, just want to talk about um, the Transformers comic from IDW, because it does deal sure. with this, but, um, so my favorite arc in, in that so far, I've only read the first three IDW collections, which is like the first 30, 40 issues or so, but... Um, my favorite arc in it is called uh, Stormbringer, which is basically the Autobots and Decepticons go back to Cybertron because um, a, a Transformer there has awakened that's ready to tear everyone apart. Now, the idea behind this is that the Transformer that wakes up, I think it's Thunderwing. I don't remember off the end, but I think it's Thunderwing. Um, but this Transformer has woken up, and the way everyone reads it as, is that because Cybertron is like a conscious being. So they read it as this Transformer has now woken up because of the damage done to Cybertron by the war from the Autobots and the Decepticons that have depleted its resources and destroyed several areas. They can't be repaired anymore. This Transformer now wakes up and is going to eradicate everything so the planet is able to heal itself. And they are able to fight it back the first time. And then as the planet started healing when all the Transformers left, they come back and it shows up again as a defense mechanism. And so the whole idea behind Stormbringer ultimately shows, ultimately connects both to its a really interesting anti-war theme and the global warming theme because that book wants to very clearly say that no matter who's right about the ideological issues behind a war, everyone is still going to lose something. And so mm -hmm. when in the case of Cybertron, they make it very clear that like Cybertron is an energy war, that Energon as a substance is a is an analogous to something like oil and its constant quest has has caused both people to fracture off and try and create their own sources of energy like shockwave does or people to like constantly rely on supplies a acting as if they aren't being depleted and the planet itself is getting set to implode and is trying to fight back because there is literally at that point in time no voice for the place that they all fucking live on um, it's really interesting because it paints both the Autobots and Decepticons as morally gray because despite whatever disagreement Optimus has with Megatron, the fact that he can still continues to perpetuate the war and, and take Energon from the planet makes him just as bad as Megatron. Yeah, and it's it's interesting because there's this, 
you touched on some with the idea of, of sources, resources that never get depleted. And that's something that I just do not understand in the real world about uh, policies on energy. Um, because, okay, let's, let's just say, let's, let's use just this huge gimme. Let's say that global warming is not man-made, that it's happening, but it's, it's oceans and that nothing humans do is having any effect on it one way or the other. That's, that's a huge gimme. There's so much bullshit in that sentence. Well, let's just give, let's just use it as a gimme. What is the argument for not being more energy efficient then? Like, like, just, I don't understand. Like, people make the argument, oh, well, man hasn't really affected global warming all that much, blah, blah, blah. So there's really no reason to be energy efficient. No, there's still fairly good reasons to be energy efficient. All of these are, are good policies, regardless of global warming. And the fact that they're, you know, global warming is happening because of human activity is also a really good reason. Like I just, I, Ted Cruz gave that, gave a speech about that at one point. He's like, oh, I've seen the numbers and human activity isn't really in place, so there's no need for all these energy saving programs. Well, what's wrong with energy saving programs? Why is that a problem to begin with? Um, I just, I don't get that. <laughs> uh, I, I don't know. I, I read, um, I, I looked into this one guy who, he's gotten a lot of buzz on the internet because he wrote like a book where he takes a stance where he's saying that um, he honestly believes that using fossil fuels is like actually better in pretty much every capacity than trying to convert to green energy. And he lays out this case that like, uh, like he, he doesn't claim that like climate change isn't real or anything like that, but he, he does, he's like, look, there are, um, like there, you know how, have you ever heard people use like, it's like the 97%, they like talk about how like, it's like 97% of scientists in the field of, uh, climate science believe in man caused climate change. Um, mm -hmm. like that's the statistic. Well, there's there's a lot of buzz on the internet because that's not true because there was this like petition that was like scientists were signing it if they wanted to be like they wanted to have like the statistic or some it was some bullshit and they needed to get like a, a petition with all the scientists that are climate change deniers to they had they were all signing this petition and the amount of scientists that signed it was over would obviously be over three percent of all scientists so like that statistics patent like is just obviously not true and he raises a bunch of cases about how like a lot of research facilities can't get their funding to even do climate science unless it is to confirm cl uh, climate change and if, if you fail to produce evidence of that, then you, like, refuse to get some of your funding and your grants and whatever for, like, specific research facilities and stuff like that. And he was just raising – he was just taking, like, a principled stance against, uh, like, green energy and climate change. And he had a lot of interesting things to say. But, I mean, at the end of the day, I don't know how um, – I guess I don't understand how cars being more fuel efficient using fossil fuel – is somehow a bad thing. Like, that's that's more my general thing of, like, okay, Ted Cruz, so a car that can go 50 miles to a gallon as opposed to 10 is bad because... <laughs> like, I guess it's, like, even, the if hassle. You, even if... Yeah, yeah. Even if you give him that, that, like... And, once again, huge fucking gimme, but even if you set that aside, like, what is the argument against energy efficiency policies. So, what is the argument against low flow toilets? So I don't here here's the argument I have gotten because as of right now I am in an energy economics class and and my professor seems to have a hard time understanding the concept of of like save the planet now because the argument he gives in response to everything we've talked about in regards to energy efficiency is that well we could save the planet now or we could just let the natural market forces take care of it in the future. That, like, if energy is really a problem, then eventually we'll come to a point where, like, we devise something better when we really need it. 
That's such a fucking bizarre way to think about the world. It's that is like the procrast. Like you, you know what you should do, Steve? Do you get homework for that class? Yes. <laughs> you should not turn any of it in until the last <laughs> day. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, I'm really tempted to push That's what him I did in so many classes in like, senior year of high school. <laughs> I'm really tempted to push him on that because, I mean, uh, like my counter argument that would very easily be like, okay, so what you're saying is let everyone that's going to die die until people figure it out. Well, you know what's really right. fucked up about <laughs> it is that, like, we used to have this, like, concept of, like, oh, eventually we'll run out of, like, oil and, like, we won't be able to have gasoline because we'll run out of these fossil fuels, but. Um, actually, like, what we've discovered in recent years is that, like, there's actually so much of it that we can now access that we couldn't previously, and, like, now we have the ability to go, like, around big chunks of, like, really tough rock instead of yeah, glue yeah, it and all these... That's causing even, the thing is, that's causing even more problems because now you're, like, disrupting groundwater supplies. Yeah, but, no, but you're also, like, you're also, like, saying now the eventually we'll run out of it is, like, no longer a motivating factor for some people now. Whereas, like, there was, like, some sort of, like, group think going on in, like, the early 2000s where it was, like, if we, uh... It, where it was, like, oh, well, I mean, like, what happens when we run out, man? Like, <laughs> but then, like, I don't think anyone really thinks about it that way anymore because we've realized it's such an abundant resource, which is kind of, like, a horrible thing. Historically, there was this problem... Yeah of lots of environmentalists constantly predicting at what point certain resources would run out. <clears throat> Al Gore, Al Gore. Al Gore, yeah, Al Gore for sure. But then, like, um, there were definitely a lot of others that did this, and they kept being wrong. So people yeah, stopped so believing them, which is the issue. Like, uh, there, there was, it's famously, there was, like, an environmentalist and an economist that made a bet that said, okay, give me a list of, like, five resources you think will be gone in ten years. And so they made that bet. And then 10 years later, the economist was right and everything was still there. So, like, he had to pay out the difference of their value. And so, like, there is this stigma against, like, anyone that says we're running out of things because we never quite seem to. But it that I feel like the mentality even of, like, resources running out isn't where this should be at. It should be more about the idea of, like, okay, what does getting these resources cost everything else? Like, yeah, we like, mentioned fracking, like, sure, lots more oil, but, like, what happens to the poisoned water tables? Yeah, what happens to the groundwater, and, and guess what? Fucking man-made earthquakes. Earthquakes. Like, of all the things that could be man-made, like, natural disasters that could be man-made, earthquakes seem like the one thing that we couldn't possibly be responsible for. But there you go. <laughs> like, you want to talk about deeper and deeper oil drilling. Well, that worked out great for the Gulf of Mexico, didn't it? <laughs> Pretty soon we're gonna move to the windmill, all entirely windmilled, like like powered wind powered machines. But it's gonna like slow down the rotation of the Earth because of all of the windmills. Like it'll be like the like slow <laughs> the rotation of the Earth drag. and it'll spin out of orbit. <laughs> Rascal, I don't think you understand how drag works, <laughs> the gravity <laughs> or revolution of the Earth. <laughs> but uh, it's it's adorable. No, that's what's gonna happen. <laughs> Revolution well, of the Earth is the thing that makes time go forward, right? So, like, if we reverse it, we can go back in time. Yes, and yes no Christopher Reeve. Okay. Yes, that's exactly how that cool. works. All right. Thanks, Richard Donner. <laughs> no, just just because. This always annoys me when people talk about how that movie's stupid for, for that scene. It's clearly not him reversing the rotation of the Earth that's making time go backwards. He's making time go backwards, and we're seeing the... Re the Earth's rotation reverse as a result. That's what's happening in that scene, but everyone acts like, oh, well, Superman reversed the rotation of the Earth, so therefore, that made time go backwards? That's weird. No, no, you got it backwards. So stop it. <laughs> I mean, it's yeah, still, really it's still kind of dumb, but I don't care. I love that movie. I well, love that fucking movie, dude. It's, dumb. it's like, it, people make it dumber than it actually is, though. That's true. I, that's problem. true. Uh, and I that's mean, what nothing's dumber than the forget than the forget guests in the second. Yeah, one. exactly. We, we can all agree on that. No, but, no, but, uh, but it's, that was a great it's slot like, element. What? Why is it that you know Wayne Enterprise, Wayne Enterprises, or well, let me get off Bruce Wayne. Who's another? Oh, Steve, you're here. 
Uh, Tony Stark, environmentalism, go. Okay, so, um, back in the 90s, when, well, it wasn't 90s, it was the early 2000s, um, when Kurt Busiek was writing Iron Man right after the Heroes of Born Crap, uh, Tony didn't have his company anymore and decided to start up a consultation firm, which was Stark Solutions, and Stark mm-hmm. Solutions, very close to Fraction, I'll get to Fraction in a second, um, is the closest thing Tony Stark's ever been to to being a socialist, because <laughs> Stark Solutions' whole idea was, okay, Businesses want to do X. I will consult you on how to do X because I'm Tony Stark and I'm always fucking rich. So you listen to me and I will charge you upfront obscene amounts of money and people will still hire me because I, because of my name. And all of that money that he's going to charge people from is going to go to the Maria Stark Foundation so he can start fixing environmental damage, so he can start repairing um, battle damaged areas of superhero conflicts, so he can like help bad low income neighborhoods. There's an entire arc about a, an, an island that's entirely there for rich people to get off on, and that it gets under attack by a communist villain that says that these rich people have been ruining the environment and um, and infrastructure all around the world. And then the volcano erupts, and it's very clearly a metaphor for global warming and capitalism. Um, and so Tony Stark's been environmentally aware at least since the early 2000s. And then Matt Fraction's run kicks in with Stark Resilient, and the whole point of Stark Resilient is to make the entire world fuel efficient with repulsor technology, completely free renewable energy within like a span of 50 years. So the first thing he does when he starts Stark Resilient is he tells all the military and oil companies up front that I will put you out of business until unless you help me create this renewable energy resource. And it was all amazing and great. And then the Marvel Universe, like, rebooted, and we forgot about it. It seems like the movies kind of forgot about it. Like, seriously, after Avengers, he's never mentioned clean energy. I know. I don't understand why we can't keep that going somewhere. Like, Tony Stark very clearly has an environmentalist bend that no one wants to talk about. That was the whole point of Fraction's run. Well, see, they just fixed the problem, and they never addressed it in the movies, okay? They've, they've officially stopped climate change in the Marvel Cinematic Universe. It's done. I guess it's possible. <laughs> it, it would seem that way. Um, I mean, the Avengers, no, ha- the Avengers helicarriers did start to use repulsor tech after the first movie, so... Yeah, so there you go. Um, no, it's just, that's a weird thing, like, because he mentions it in the first in the first Iron Man movie. He mentions, I want to look into repul- repulsor tech... And then Obadiah Stane's like, oh, we just did that to make the, you know, the hippies happy. And he's like, no, it's actually working. And so then you're like, oh, so, okay, he's going to fix, like, the environment. Perfect. And then, like, you get that quick drop. It's, it's, I don't think it's mentioned anywhere in Iron Man 2. And then you get that quick line drop in Avengers. is like, I'm the only name in clean energy, really. And and that's that was the last of it. As far as I can tell, he moved into protective robots. Um... For some reason, <laughs> yeah, I, like that's, I, that's a very big jump. <laughs> I don't know where the repulsor tech went. I feel like some of that should be brought up in another movie at some point. Ah, uh, well, if they do hand off the Iron Man franchise to someone else, maybe, maybe they can keep having Robert Downey Jr. come back as like you know a public figure that's working in, on environmentalism, and he's not Iron Man anymore. That'd be interesting. It's really yeah. Um, it's it's kind of glaring when you think about like Iron Man three and the whole Iron Man three. Like there's that whole scene of like the president about to be burned, lit on fire above an oil rig, and like there's and yeah, and they don't. It, it has like no environmental context whatsoever. Besides that, it's an oil rig. It's weird. It, yeah, it's odd that the repulsor tech just doesn't get mentioned anywhere. I don't know. Ah, oh, that's that's really really weird. I know, and I mean, <laughs> Iron Man comics have this. Like the the moment Busick left Iron Man. Um, and then Joe Quesada did his thing that didn't really count, but as, as soon as Busek left <laughs> Iron Man, who wrote, who, who wrote Tony as, like, a very left-wing, almost socialist, immediately after that, you get, like, Frank Thierry and, and Mike Grell, who write him as, like, a very sure-of-himself conservative. It's so weird how people just bounce all over the place with that. Um, and especially on Iron Man, because Iron Man has had consistent characterization since his inception up to the 90s. Yeah. So it's weird to like just suddenly in the last fifteen years bounce all over the place. I I guess it's just people have a perception of what he should be, and then they kind of you know bring that to him. Um, it's it's strange. Like okay, I'm trying to think of because we've talked about Bruce Wayne and Poison Ivy. We've talked about Iron Man, uh, Tony Stark. I'm trying to think of characters 
that are not rich that could do more environmentalist stuff but don't that aren't rich well rich characters you there's still ted cord that we didn't talk about um oliver queen oliver queen oliver queen and oliver ted cord do a lot yeah they they obviously do it's just like i, I don't know i guess it's a problem I, I really want an actual green arrow show you know yeah, I mean, that would be one that's cool. Actually, <laughs> oh my god, that would be cool. <laughs> one that's actually about a, a hippie billionaire. Um, that'd be fantastic. But anyway, you no. Know, so yeah, Oliver Queen is definitely one that that actually cares about the environment. DCAU got that right from episode one with him. Um, I love their Green Arrow. He's so good. He's fucking awesome. Ba ba da 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 ba. <laughs> I love that they open with him taking out thugs in a shopping market. Like that's just that's just who Oliver Queen is. Yeah, yeah. Um, but yeah. no, they're Green Arrow. Really, like you know, what's that line he has? Uh, like that that bit of dialogue he has with Captain Adam. He's like, um, is that a containment suit? Yeah, I'm pure energy now. He's like, he says something, and Oliver Queen goes, "You sound like what I marched against in college." <laughs> <laughs> yes, I, love, I love that hero. Um, oh my god, that's the question, awesome. The question when Greg Rucka was writing her um, had a little bit of an environmentalist mentioning here and there, but like it wasn't explicitly about that. It's just mm-hmm. because Vic Sage is kind of zen, and so Renee Montoya had conversations about it, but it would never really went anywhere. Gotcha. Um, heroes that aren't rich that, that might deal with this. Um... Or that should be, because, like, again, Green Lantern should be dealing with this. I feel like, um, I feel like someone like, um, the Ghost Rider or Spectre could. Hmm. Because there's a little bit of, like, protecting the natural order of things with Ghost Rider. And then there's a little bit of that with Spectre as well. Like, Spectre isn't just punishment purely for moral atrocities amongst other people, but also, like, moral atrocities in terms of the planet. Yeah, I could see that. Like, you know, someone is, um, is destroying, uh, like, a, the habitat of a species, and so Spectre comes in to, to deliver punishment for that. Yeah, and I mean, also, like I mentioned earlier, like, environmental racism of, like, okay, you, you industrialize a specific forest, and you remove all the indigenous people, and you move in all, like, all the white captains of industry, Spectre shows up, finds the person who did it, has them, like, ripped apart by, by now-extinct animals or something. Oh, that'd be cool. Um, it's also a very Spectre thing to do. And Ghost Rider, again, has done a little bit of this. Um, in the 90s, when you had the Danny Catch stuff, there was a lot of commentary on urban violence and environment and um, family dysfunction and stuff that just went absolutely nowhere because Marvel events in the 90s. Mm, Marvel. Um, yeah. Uh, I'm trying to think on the DC side, other characters that should be dealing with this. Like, again, just Green Lantern, it just makes perfect sense. And you could do the, the Star Trek thing. Like, that's the thing with Green Lantern, is it's this, like, weird little in-between of Star Trek and Star Wars, where it can really be both. It can, like, do the big epic space battle stuff that we associate with Star Wars, where it's, like, you know, the, the two mystic forces in the galaxy or whatever... And they can also do, like, the really smart, preachy sci-fi stuff like Star Trek. So Green Lantern should be dealing with this. And you could do, like, the one and done goes to a planet where it's just a metaphor for whatever we're dealing with on Earth. And then deal with it. Um, and that, that's actually one where you could solve it in one episode. Or one issue or something. Um, um, so I'm trying to think of other characters that should be dealing with it in DC, though. So I've got two. Um... One of them I know deals with it is uh, in Gail Simone's Secret Six when Catman is... Oh, yeah. Because Cat, Catman's dad was, like, a big game hunter, and so, like, Catman himself is very much against that, and he's talked about it several times. But then the other one, I think Martian Manhunter would be really cool to do environmentalist stuff with. Oh, yeah, I can see that, because he's fucking lost his planet once. Exactly, like, and plus, he was on Mars, and, like, so the whole idea of, like, him coming to Earth and seeing uh, types of natural beauty that didn't exist on his planet, and seeing people willfully destroy it, must hit him in some place. It's an interesting thing, because from, it, it's been a while since I looked into this, so the, the thinking in, in the scientific community may have changed, but... 
I remember hearing that Mars at one point was very Earth-like, um, and just something happened to it that we don't have enough information on to make it into what it is now. And so I, I kind of like the idea of Martian society, Mars used to be very Earth-like in, in its natural beauty, but then the either the Martians destroyed it themselves, or maybe the white Martians destroyed, like, you know, harvested all the resources, destroyed it, and then that's why it is just a giant desert now. Um, yeah, no, that it'd be interesting to deal with more of that in, in a Martian Manhunter series, because he had a comic for a while, and it never went anywhere near that issue. Um, what's his name? Um, Firestorm did, I know this for a fact, because in the John Ostrander Firestorm run, it is a whole thing against how nuclear testing has destroyed certain environmental habitats that will never come back. And then the other obvious one that we didn't mention is Animal Man. Oh, sure. Yeah, yeah, that, that writes itself, right? Yeah, I mean, Grant um, Morrison did this, so... Yeah, of course. Grant Morrison's done everything. This is true. <laughs> um, and, I mean, there was, there was a second run on Animal Man after Grant Morrison left that did a lot of this. It wasn't as good, but that's because you can't follow up Grant Morrison. <laughs> <laughs> um yeah yeah i tend to agree i'm just trying to think of like other characters that i want to see deal with this a little bit more um this is really random but silver surfer I'm just throwing it out yeah. there yeah random as fuck that'd be interesting because he's been responsible for destroying planets yeah. yeah well and i mean like it goes back to his whole thing being herald of galactus to try to feed him worlds that don't necessarily aren't necessarily going to survive as long. Like, he's very consciously going for the near-dead planets already. Mm. So, like, to, especially if you're going to have him not be Galactus's Herald anymore, see him going around trying to find his, his his home again, and in the process trying to save planets that do have potential for the future, as opposed to what he was doing with Galactus, which is feeding him worlds that didn't have a future. It'd be a fun parallel. Or it'd be interesting to go back and redo the Galactus Silver Surfer origin thing and have him come to Earth because he realizes that it doesn't have very long left. Yeah, yeah. Um, That'd be a really good way if they ever go back and redo that origin. Yeah. Um, Black Panther has dealt with this in the same way. Yeah, yeah, Black Panther definitely has. Um, there's There was a little bit that of that even in the, the animated series where yeah. Wakanda was the only fully clean energy nation. Yeah. Um, Earth Mightiest Heroes I don't think touched it very much, but a lot of the Jack Kirby comics did. Really? I didn't realize Jack Kirby was that far ahead. Yeah, um, the Jack Kirby comics did, and then the guy who did those four Black Panther minis, Panther's Rage, Panther's, Panther's Prey, and two others... Forget his name off the top of my head, um, but he did a lot of that. He he was really ahead of his time when it came to like coloniality of the mindset and stuff. What hmm. what about in Ultimate? Isn't it Ultimate Avengers where they have Thor and he's like a part of some like like green yeah. movement or something in the beginning of that? Yeah, yeah, oh, yeah. This is such a one off and it has nothing to do with anything else. Yeah, right. in the Ultimate comic, the second one deals a lot with like what happened to Thor and why he's like a hippie. Um, and that's really interesting. The movies don't really touch on it, but there is, there is some of that there. Um, the ultimate comics though, they don't really talk about environmentalism. It's just kind of, there as a backdrop because it wants to be hip and modern. And it's more about like critique of Bush administration stuff, for both of those. And I think that's a problem. We, we talked a little bit about ago about why we don't touch the subject more. And part of it is, you know, it's too preachy. Yeah. Part of it is that, like, there's no easy solution. And so how do you end a story like that? But also part of it is, you know, it's just like, it's such a gimmick to do this kind of thing. It feels like you're trying to pander. Um and I, I, I can't deny that, that you get a sense of that from time to time, that something is just blatantly trying to pander to you or, or to a certain set of people. It's hard for a writer to get past that, so you need something that is just a genuinely good story about this, that, that, that feels like it's a story that needs to be told, not one that they just wanted to shoehorn in there. Yeah, and I mean, we... We have talked about a lot of characters that this would be a natural place to go with. So, like, if you didn't want to make it feel pandering, then okay, fine, don't deal with it in the Superman book. But do with something with Poison Ivy, do something with Green Lantern, do something with Swamp Thing. Um, like, there were avenues to talk about this 
that don't have to be preachy or one-sided like people are afraid of. Yeah, I'm, I'm trying to think of a character that, like... Are there characters that it shouldn't be done with? Like, just blatantly, this is not a character that needs to address this issue. Um, hmm. I don't think Daredevil needs anything to do with environmentalism. It's kind of not his shtick. Mm-hmm. Um, um, like, I'm just, I'm trying to think of characters where it's, like, it's, like, hypocritical for them to talk about this kind of thing. Hypocritical. Um... Uh, I don't know about him. It's, it's it's just a thought that I'm having, and it's one of those things where I wish I had an example to go with it. But I'm, I'm trying to think: is there like a, a is there a character that made his money on oil, or that, that is pollution? <laughs> and, <laughs> probably forethoughtful enough not to have those be things, but yeah, maybe. Yeah, I don't think we've done that. I don't think we have, like, an oil tycoon superhero. Um... Yeah, we need one. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> we can call him W. <laughs> um... I mean, mm. some of, like, more technology-based heroes than aren't loaded don't, maybe not necessarily need to deal with this stuff. Like, I, I have a hard time finding any reason why someone like the Vision needs to care about this. Yeah, Vision, and I, I don't think X-Men need to approach this very much. They kind of got their own problems they need to deal with first. X-Men is a weird oh. thing for me, where I feel like the, the, the metaphoric potential for that series is never completely realized, so, like, why even bother at another thing if you're not going to fully talk about everything else that should be on your plate? Yeah, so I, I don't think X, I think X Men needs to to finish their their whole concept before they can branch out to other things. I can see um, an argument being made for both why Spider Man can and shouldn't be environmentalist. I think you could play both sides there. A bit, a, 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 you know, some new CEO comes into New York and wants to get rid of Central Park to build a new nuclear facility in the center of New York. And Peter Parker, Spider-Man, has to stop him. <laughs> the name of this business tycoon, Victor fucking Von Doom. Fantastic <laughs> Four gets crossed over into the mix. Okay? I'd watch that. Or I don't know. <laughs> um, there you yeah, go. like, I, I don't know if there's, like, a, a right answer. I was just curious if anyone had anything off the top of their head. Like, no, I don't want to see this character deal with environmental issues. I, and I think that's that's probably a good thing that we're having a hard time thinking of characters that flat out should not. There are characters who probably you don't really have a lot to say with yeah. that like, aren't the best fit, but I don't think there's any... I, I doubt there are very many characters that, like, just blatantly should not deal with this issue. Yeah, like, I feel like most characters in some way, shape, or form can make a case for this. Like, Doctor Strange easily could. Um, you could do something like uh, with Wolverine about it. Um, you could probably do stuff with Thor in this regard. Like, it, it's very easy to come up with, with stories in this vein. It's just a matter of making them nuanced. Mm -hmm. Yeah, because you don't want it to be preachy. And, like, that's the thing, you know... I hate when something addresses or does something that is needed and is is important. Like when something does, you know, more diverse casting, for example. I hate it when something does that and is bad, and is bad almost because of them doing that. Yeah. Because it, like, gives fuel to people who say, we just shouldn't be dealing with this kind of thing in comics or movies or whatever. Yeah. We just shouldn't be worrying about these things. Like... I hate when some when a movie or a series or something does diverse casting, and then it's bad because it gives people an excuse to say, "Well, see, it didn't work here." That really annoys me when that happens. So I wouldn't want a ton of stuff like. Don't get me wrong. I don't want everything to do environmentalism, whether or not they have a story. No, they they should have a story to do it. But the same thing. I just don't know why we haven't been dealing with it more. Again. Why the fuck isn't Poison Ivy a major villain again? <laughs> Deadpool environmentalism adventure. Oh my god. That'd be amazing. <laughs> I read the shit out of that. Um, 
Because I feel like that's your example of hypocrisy right there. Like, right in the forefront, Deadpool's like, I know I shouldn't be doing this, but I am anyway. <laughs> um, fuck, you could totally make it, like, it's a comic that's riffing on, like, on, on like uber right-wingism and, like, denying issues, and Deadpool's just making fun of, like, the fact that his book is turned into environmentalism because PC culture and stuff. <laughs> <laughs> That'd be so much fun. I wonder if I wonder if I can find a panel of Deadpool talking about SJWs. I'm gonna Google that. <laughs> I'm sure he probably can. Um, so yeah, it's really difficult to find a, a person or character that really shouldn't deal with it. And, and you're right, like that that is probably a good thing. Um, the one thing I still wonder about with like making environmentalism like a central thing in comics. Uh, is that notion of, like, how far can you actually take it? Um, like, you can't solve this issue. As much as, as ambitious as Faction was, I recognize that he couldn't have, like, made it so the Marvel Universe is completely energy efficient, because that would kill, in some sense, the realism. So, how far do you go with this? Like, even if you get launched that Poison Ivy book, she, there's only so much she can do. You'd have to depower her, because, like, in certain books, like Low, um, the the Riddler story, the bitch made a goddamn rainforest in Gotham Central Park, yeah. um, just in her off time, and created fucking life, like you know, not not just plant life, like like sentient life in in just fucking the middle of Gotham Central Park, basically. So, yeah, you you would have to limit her her power level, Dragon Ball Z probably shouldn't do stuff. I don't know. Maybe Dragon Ball Z could do environmentalism. I don't know. I don't think Goku's smart enough to handle it. <laughs> um, I don't think Dragon Ball Z is ever like, well, there was that whole thing with Bardock. Yeah. Um, no, but just like, you'd, you'd have to limit, limit uh, Ivy's power level in order for that book to go on for any amount of time because if you just... You know, she could just fucking go anywhere and start creating rainforests and saving species that have otherwise gone extinct. So it would just okay. Let's just let po poison ivy go. Problem solved. You could probably do like some kind of arc where she tries to become isolationist and like just has her own rainforest and does nothing but try to protect it for a while, and then from there I, have her travel I around. Really, um... I, I can't remember what it was, but I specifically remember reading something where she basically did that, or at least tried to. I don't know No Man's like, Land has a bit like that. Maybe. she. Maybe that's where it's from. Like, she set up on a deserted island and just created, like, this amazingly lush rainforest, and then it got, like, napalm bombed for some reason. And it just, like, all fucking burnt to the ground. Okay, I don't remember that. But I know in No Man's Land she had, like, a, her own little central hub, like most characters. Yeah, yeah, she she took over Central Park in No Man's Land. She does that a lot to Gotham City. Gotham City must have a really, really interesting biodiverse Central Park. <laughs> um, Arkham Knight, as flawed as it is in places, I liked what they did with, with Poison Ivy and her sacrifice and, like combat, like, like using the city's own nature to combat military-industrial complex through Arkham Knight. I think that's kind of mm. cool. Okay, I haven't played Arkham Knight still, so I, I have no input on that. Um, it's, it's I agree, it is cool. I have played Arkham Knight. It's a fun game. I don't hate it. Uh, mm. Yeah, it, it's fun. It's The ultimate praise from Steve Baxey. I don't hate it. <laughs> <laughs> 10 out of 10, I don't hate it. <laughs> um, I don't know if you guys have, have read any of the Injustice comics, but um, some of those ha have some, like, environmental commentary on, like, what the world looks like after Superman takes over and, like, how certain populations just kind of, like, hide out in their own little ecosystems and hubs so that they're not impacted, impacted by the politics of Superman. Interesting. And then Black Widow had an ongoing back in the 70s or 80s where, like, she was sort of a social crusader going around and, like, protecting 
protecting like like women from abusers and and like Captain Planet style lecturing about the environment, but it wasn't very good. Yeah, and that's that's what I'd be worried about is just something that sucks. Let's let's get a cool reboot of Captain Planet. I think it could be done. Can it can it be done with Don Cheadle? Did you watch anything past that first video he did? No. Oh, dude, he did a whole series of those. <laughs> it gets so fucking dark. I I need to watch those now. I fucking love that first video. <laughs> he did like I think three or four episodes, and they get so fucked. It's amazing. Oh, <laughs> uh, yeah. Um, it's it's something else. All right. Well, I don't know. I think we're about at the end of this. Like, I just, I, it, it's an interesting topic, and I'm not surprised that we couldn't get away from environmentalism, but I wasn't sure if we might or not. Yeah. Um, did anyone have any final thoughts they wanted to get out on this? I'm good. Rasko, you good too? Go green. Yep. Um, just I'm just gonna throw this one out there and leave it to smarter people than me to figure out. Um, and this has nothing to do with Congress. This is totally just an environmental thing. Um, why isn't it possible to create a desalination plant that is hydroelectrically powered by the water that it's taking in to desalinate? I just just throw that out there. It seems perfectly feasible to my brain. I don't know. Maybe there's a reason. Or maybe just no one's thought of it. (laughs) It's probably feasible. It's probably a situation, though, where, like... It's probably tough to, like... To get it to sustain itself long enough or, like... Keep it outside of, like, a lab setting. I think you'd need a kickstart from the grid, but I think it could get, like reasonably self-sufficient within, like, a very short period of time. I don't know. You just pull directly from the ocean. I mean, I, I don't know about enough about biotech to look into it, but... Yeah, no, I just, just a thought I had. Like, why isn't that, like, a thing that we could do? It seems perfectly feasible to me. I don't know. Anyway, that'll that'll do it. Uh, let's, let's see here. What are we going to talk about next time, Steve? Uh, review topic, right? Yes. Okay. Um, hmm... Unless, Rasco, would you like to join us next time and give Steve a break? Uh, for for what? Like A uh, review topic? I'll let you pick. Oh, fuck. Let me see if there's anything <laughs> on Netflix that we, that we haven't touched. Uh, oh, those are the best. Okay, wait, wait. So it can be anything on Netflix? It can be anything, honestly. So yeah. if I pick something, it, like a movie, you have to watch a mo- this movie and then we get to talk about this movie? Yes. Sure. Oh, fuck, yes. Okay. Um, the the invitation. Oh God, what is this? The invitation. That's the movie. Is this on Netflix? It's on Netflix. Netflix. It's just got. It was just added to Netflix. I think pretty recently. Um, I remember I, this. I remember this well. Oh God, this is like really. I'm I'm like really nervous. I don't know. How what did you feel be. about it, Steve? Um. I don't want to spoil it, so... Okay. Next week should be interesting, then. I don't know what's going to happen. Okay. Okay. I mean, I'm excited. Okay. All right. Uh, Everyone, thanks very much for listening. Uh, Next week, we'll be talking about the invitation, whatever the fuck that is. Until next time, I'm the philosopher. I'm the politician. And I'm the squampus. And we are your geeky gentlemen, and we will be discussing things.